Hello, welcome to Pause for Faith. It's very good to be with you. Let me get all my settings up and running. Let me get all my settings. Great. Look, I want to think with you about St. Clair of Assisi, just to look at life together. And the reason I'm doing this is because I want to speak eventually about Franciscan spirituality in, a, in another session, another video. So I've spoken about the life of St. Francis. I'll put that video into the video description here so you can jump back and see that later on if you want. To think about St. Clair now and then to bring this together another time in looking at what the spirituality of Francis and Clare and the great tradition of the Franciscan movement can say to us today, but really just to focus on her life now. What a wonderful saint. And it's so alive, the, the spirit of Clare and Francis, when you go to Assisi. It's been years since I've been, but I must say it's one of my favourite places in the whole world. If you're lucky enough to visit and God willing, um, when the pandemic is over, and just to say once in your life, if, if God gives you that great gift to be able to visit Assisi. The beauty of the town, um, the, the way, I mean, the beauty of, of the place, of the mountains, of the air, of the, of the town, but the way it seems to hold something of the spirit of Clare and St Francis. It's all very romantic as well. It's beautiful. It's got lovely shops, these winding alleys, these beautifully kept churches. But you really do feel as if you're walking in the footsteps of Francis and Clare and breathing the air they breathed. And especially with St Clare, that you can go to the church of San Damiano, which is where her convent was. So it's, it's moved now. The, the poor Clare community moved into the town afterwards and you can go to the monastery in the church of St Clare in the centre of the town but just to go and visit the the convent of San Damiano just down the hill just outside the town where Clare lived for most of her adult and monastic life where all of these stories we're going to hear about took place you just feel that you're very very close to Clare and Francis and the Franciscan spirit. St. Clair was born in 1193 and died in 1253. So she died at the age of 60. So she lived a lot longer than, than St. Francis. So she really was the preserver of his memory as well as much else. Brought up in a, in a well-off family in Assisi. Her mother was Ortolana, her father Favarone. And we begin to, to hear about her story, her life, from what I'll go on to, the incident when she met Francis about the age of 18. But just to note that very often girls, young women of that time, would have been married at 14 or 15. So we can't be absolutely sure about this, but it, we've got good reason to believe that as a single woman, age 18, who had younger sisters who couldn't be married before her, there would have been a big pressure on her to marry younger than that time of 18. So just the sense that this was a woman who, even before we knew her, was thinking about life, was quite determined, possibly had made a decision that she wanted to not be married and live some kind of alternative life, which then meant becoming some kind of religious sister. We're not sure, but just... It's telling itself that she was growing into adulthood, 18, unmarried and of such a strong character and with some ideas of where she wanted to go. The sense that she was a, a strong minded individual who was able to resist the, the family pressures, which must have been growing to get married up to this point. But here she is at 18 and St. Francis preaches the Lenten sermons at the Church of San Giorgio in Assisi. So he is Francis, someone who would have been well known about town, about Assisi, as, as a young merchant, a young, a young man, a young teenager, and then a young adult, but has very recently had this conversion experience and gone to live outside the city at the bottom of the hill around the Port Siuncula, St Mary of the Angels, in, in the very beginnings of a community committed to poverty 
and a new form of religious life and following Jesus Christ in absolute simplicity and poverty. Francis preaches in the town of Assisi, the Lenten sermons, and it was such a radical message, and it must have sounded so new and fresh, a message of personal conversion and a new kind of happiness and fulfilment based around following Jesus Christ without reservation and transforming yourself and the world through the gift of the Holy Spirit and through the the acceptance of poverty and of sacrifice. Claire was moved by these sermons and entranced by Francis, not, not in just some kind of romantic adolescent falling in love infatuation. Francis spoke to something that was already growing in her heart, a longing for holiness, for a radical way of living the Christian life, for for a new way of of making sense of of her own life and of the Christian faith, and quite possibly a, a growing sense of being called to some kind of religious life. She began to renounce the idea of marriage. It was becoming much clearer to her. She supported Francis. She began to send money down to support the friars as they were rebuilding the chapel of the Portsiuncula at the bottom of the hill. She began to meet Francis secretly and to talk about his way of life, him speaking about Um, contempt of the world, of power, of glory, and the beauty of following Jesus Christ in simplicity and poverty, of loving God, of choosing to be less. This was one of Francis's favourite words. Remember, they were the lesser friars, the minores, the, the lesser friars. On Palm Sunday, 12... 12, when Claire was 19, I think, 18 or just into 19, she attended a CC Cathedral for the blessing of the palms. In the evening of March the 18th, Claire obviously had been talking to Francis, thinking, praying about this. The 18th of March, night of 18th, 19th of March, this is when she made the decision to leave the world, to use that language, and to follow Christ and to follow Francis. She ran away from home. She went down the hill to the Portsiuncula. She promised before the friars and before God to forsake all her possessions and become a nun. Francis and the brothers met her at the door of the chapel of Our Lady of the Angels, the Portsiuncula, with lighted tapers in their hands. So clearly this was planned. This was This was an escape that was carefully planned. So she knew what was going to happen. They knew the date. She arranged to go. She left in secret. They were waiting to welcome her. She abandoned her fine clothes before the altar. And Francis cut off her hair and gave her the penitential habit, a sackcloth of tunic, a tunic tied about with a cord. And she was she went to live temporarily, as much as anything else, for safety and security in the Benedictine convent of St. Paul near the town of Bastia, just a, a way away. So not just a fleeting moment, not just hearing Francis preach and running after him, hearing him preach, growing in faith, going to meet him secretly for conversations and spiritual direction and a deeper understanding. If you like, this was her novitiate, her thinking and discerning, coming to a very clear decision, an irrevocable decision, that this was the moment to to change and to follow Francis, follow Christ, live religious life at this young age of 18, 19. And you can't, you can, maybe you can, but just it's hardly possible to imagine the radicalness of cutting off the hair because the hair in that age it is true of some cultures today but in that age it symbolized so much about her identity as a woman her status in society her her ability to present herself to be married 
and, and the cutting off the hair symbolised in such a concrete, radical way a decision to live an alternative life, to step out of the stream of what would have been the social norms, even the religious norms, and to say, I want to make a break, I want to find my own way, and I'm not just following the path of family and marriage and society and status and everything that's been expected of me. It was a no turning back moment. And that we would have equivalents of that. And in some cultures, it might be today still cutting off the hair, but very much so for a woman in that culture, this was a hugely symbolic moment for her and, it, and a symbol of her, her determination and her steadfastness. As soon as this choice became known, her friends and relations came to take her home. Simple as that. You can't do this. You're crazy. But she resisted. And then she showed them her hair and they realised that there was a point of no turning back. Something fundamental had changed. She said that Christ called her to his service, that Jesus was her only husband that she wanted. And that if they carried on threatening and persecuting her, God would make her even stronger and help her to overcome them. Eventually, she moved to another convent, St. Angelo, di Panso, on the mountain slopes of Mount Suba Subasio. Her sister Agnes, her younger sister Agnes, joined them. She's now canonised as well, St Agnes of Assisi. And eventually they prevailed, the family gave up trying to capture them back. Francis gave Agnes the habit, although she was only 15, extraordinary and it seems so young to us but remember this would have been a very normal age for marrying and in that sense taking lifelong decisions. So on the one hand something utterly radical here in the decision of Claire and her sister Agnes. On the other hand not to take away from this but just to put it in context that for independent-minded women of those days, if they were going to make a radical choice, the alternative was religious life. In other words, it was radical, but it wasn't unknown. The life of Francis was radical and unknown. But religious life as an alternative to marriage and family, and as a way of stepping out of the established norms, was a reality and was an alternative more so than today, when for most people, religious life would be completely unheard of for most people. So it was radical, but it, it, in another way, it did fit into the, the possibilities for Christian women of that time. And it says something, of course, about the love and friendship and, and esteem between Francis and Claire. It was a very pure love and friendship. It's not for us to project back into it from hundreds of years later some kind of idea that um, it was a romantic love, that really there was something, um, uh, an emotional level that, that, that became kind of presented in a religious way, but really there was something else going on. No, there was something utterly pure and um, profound about their friendship which was based on their love for the Lord and what he was calling each of them to do in common but in different ways as well. So, so a deep esteem and a love and a friendship, but based on the ideals and the love of the gospel that, that it aroused in both, both of them. Yes, Claire was attracted by Francis. She spoke about how he was, quote, in conversation, agreeable, ardent and preaching, his voice firm, sweet-toned and clearly audible. And something about his personality, his message, his joy, his faithfulness. He was one of the most attractive saints that's ever walked the earth, and she was struck by him. But it was an attraction that led her closer to Jesus and to what the Lord wanted for Claire rather than getting her lost and even trapped in a cult of St Francis. Eventually, Claire and Agnes, 
we're able to move through the the, the work and the the behind the scenes maneuvering of Francis to a poor house near the church of San Damiano on the outskirts of Assisi. This is the church where Francis had been praying before the crucifix and the crucifix had spoken to Francis and said, Francis, rebuild my church. So it was a church that was special to Francis, but it had a poor house, a, a place, a kind of refuge for, for the poor of the city and people in need. And, Fran and Claire and Agnes moved in there, and it's extraordinary that she was later joined by her own mother and, and a number of others, and three members of one of the very rich families, the Ubaldini family in, Flor in, in Florence, so word got around that, that Claire of Assisi and then her sister and her mother and others were living a radical new way of life. And it, it began to speak to people and attract them. So everything we say about Claire from now on, you've got to picture her in the enclosure, in the confines of this building and this garden, just down the hill around the church of San Damiano. So the, the kind of vision is very broad, but the, the geographical reality here is Claire in her convent in Assisi for the next 40 years of her life. Francis drew up a rudimentary rule of life for them. And very soon, within just a few years, monasteries of these Franciscan nuns, what we now call poor Claire's, they were being established in several places in Italy and France. Famously, Agnes, the daughter of the King of Bohemia, founded a nunnery of the order in Prague, where she took the habit. And she became very close to Claire through, through correspondence and letters and prayer. And she is Blessed Agnes, Blessed Agnes of Bohemia. OK, so we've got the poor Claire's established the first convent and the convents growing and multiplying. <clears throat> what was the way of life? What was Claire's vision for, for her new Franciscan form of religious life for women? Well, it was a love for Jesus Christ. Well, that's every form of religious life, isn't it? Hopefully. But it was so clear and transparent in Francis and then in Claire. And it was a love for Jesus without mediation, without layers of history and tradition and, and rules and regulations. It was falling in love with Jesus Christ, wanting to know him, wanting to be close to him, through his presence in the world today, through his presence through the Holy Spirit, through his presence in prayer, through his presence in the sacraments. A love for Christ in the church, in the ministry of the priesthood, in the blessed sacrament, in the mass. A love for Christ in the gospels. A great, great love for, for the words of Jesus and the example of Jesus in the gospels. And this is the key, saying... I don't want anything to get in the way of Jesus, and I want to follow him simply without compromise. Not to be radical for its own sake, not to be a revolutionary for its own sake, but just not to get let clutter get in the way of opening the Gospels, seeing who Jesus is, what he asked us to do, how he lived, and putting that into practice. Who is Jesus? How can I know him? How can I be like him? I open the Gospels. It's crystal clear. And I live like him without making excuses, without making compromises, without putting a straitjacket or formalities and rules that might have worked in different times or in different situations. It's the simplicity of the Gospel, what it means to live that, and then trying to put that into practice in, in some way of life and rules and traditions, but doing it from the ground up. What that meant in practice was a fundamental commitment to simplicity of life and poverty. 
So a radical poverty for Claire. Remember, religious life as a woman, someone from what we would call today an upper middle class family with all the needs and luxuries she wanted. The poor Claire's, they wore no stockings, shoes, sandals or any other covering on their feet. They slept on the ground. They never ate meat. They never spoke unless necessity or charity demanded it. Claire wanted this silence in order to avoid sins of the tongue and to concentrate on holy things. It wasn't just the fasting and the fasts and the mortifications of the rule, but she wore a rough hair shirt next to her skin. Hard to imagine the discomfort, the, not the, the, the hourly daily discomfort, but the discomfort of every moment when you wear a hair shirt. And the other aspect of wearing a hair shirt, which we don't like to talk about, and it's not in every book, but is the vermin, the lice, the nits, the, the, the everything, just the horror of wearing a hair shirt, which became a way of life for them. Claire fasted on vigils. She fasted at the beginning, all Lent, on bread and water, and some days ate nothing. And look, straight away, I need to say, I'm not recommending this to you, nor did she recommend it to everyone. And she recognised later in life that some of her austerities had been too strict. And she mitigated for themself, for herself, under pressure from Francis and the bishop, saying, you need to go easy. And she mitigated, made more relaxed some of this, not the poverty, but some of this austerity to her other sisters. The point here, first of all, is that there was a radical desire to live a life of simplicity, of austerity, whatever that means and where the line is. We need to agree on that, and it will be different for each person, and of personal and communal poverty. Simplicity, austerity within the limits that are wise, and total personal and communal poverty. Now let's talk about them very briefly, just to underline that we need to be wise in our austerities and our penances. And the basic rule just in case you've never heard this, is we should never take on any penance or austerity, whether it's personal or for Lent or whatever, that damages our health. Simple rule. Or that makes us less able to fulfil our daily duties, our work, loving our friends and neighbour, loving our husband or wife, our children. So health and charity are two rules. And then each of us will be called to a different form of simplicity of life, just as we have great freedom in deciding how to live, pen, live our Lenten penances. We have a common commitment on Friday in England and Wales, for example, to abstain from meat, but we can take on extra forms of penance and austerity as long as it's wise and it's within limits and it's guided by the rule of charity and it's not damaging our own health. Okay, those just to put those things in brackets. For some ways of life, for some religious life, there is an extra commitment. It's not that we should all follow every rule that every religious has followed, but we should learn from the example and to see how that can be applied to our lives. That's what I'm going to do in the next session about Franciscan spirituality. So Claire was very strict. She was maybe too strict at the beginning. And she found a way of life that was very austere, but trying to care for herself and use common sense and wisdom with the support of the church. But a life of radical simplicity and radical self-denial. Poverty. Francis believed in poverty as simply a way of following in the footsteps of Jesus Christ. So you can argue till the cows come home about what it means and whether it's wise, but just did Jesus live a life of poverty? Yes. Yes. 
So when someone like Francis and Claire is inspired to follow and imitate Jesus, not just in a vague, abstract way, not just in a spiritual way, but really to live the life that Jesus lived, yes, that involves poverty. And for Francis, that wasn't just the communal poverty of traditional religious, where we don't own anything personally, but the, the convent, the religious order, can communally own things. It was, it was to add in that as well as personal poverty, my religious order, my house is not allowed to own anything either, because Francis could see that in traditional religious orders, there's a danger that religious houses or congregations or monasteries would actually accumulate possessions and money and become very rich. And everyone could say, oh, I'm, I'm poor really personally, but they'd be involved in and colluding in a way of life that was anything but poor. So Claire, desperate to keep the, the ideal and the reality of personal poverty and communal poverty and refusing to accept gifts of money um, and wanting to follow in the tradition of like Francis, only accepting gifts in kind, meaning if you need some food, you can beg for food. If you need some bricks to build a chapel, you can beg for bricks to build a chapel. Some of this was simplified. And there were over 40 years of arguing and discussions. There were loads of discussions about the form of poverty that would best sustain St. Clair and the poor Clares. But eventually, in fact, very near the end of her life, there was agreed with Pope Innocent IV a formula that was very strict, that Claire was happy with, that would preserve the, the sisters personally and communally in a life of total poverty. And, of course, there were discussions during and afterwards about whether this was possible, and there were different branches of the poor Clares eventually, which I think still exist today. But you can see where the heart of Clare was. How much can we do to live a life of poverty? Clare herself, I haven't said very much about her way of life, just to finish with this, with one or two stories. She was full of love for Jesus, for Francis, and for all, and especially for her sisters. She wanted to be the servant of servants. She would wash and kiss the lay sisters' feet when they returned from begging. She would serve at the table. She would look after the sick. She would say to God, do what you want with me. I am yours because my will is no longer my own. I have given it to God. When her sisters were resting, she stayed up to pray and cared for them. She was a contemplative. She was given to a life of prayer, but she was a great lover of humanity. And she, she was such a caring sister and mother to the sisters that she lived with. There's a beautiful, well-known story about her faith as well. The town of Assisi was being besieged by the armies of Frederick II, a very difficult empire at the time. The, the, the marauding armies were coming along the valley towards Assisi and San Damiano's at the bottom of the hill, halfway down the hill, was in, in the forefront of this, this invasion. And instead of giving up or compromising, even in her sickness, she took a pix, those little containers, kind of monstrance, we might say today, with the body of Christ from the tabernacle. And she, she put this pix, this monstrance, with the, the real presence of Jesus in a window that faced the attacking armies. She fell to her knees and begged Jesus in the Blessed Sacrament to turn away the armies. And at the moment of her prayer and her intercession and the power of Jesus and the faith of St. Clair, the armies turned back and did not attack Assisi. So... The faith of Claire and of the sisters, the power of Jesus Christ, saved Assisi from the attack 
of the armies of Frederick II, and this became one of the wonderful, well-known and often told stories about St. Clair. And very often, if you see an image or an icon of St. Clair, you see her holding or kneeling before a pix or a monstrance with the Blessed Sacrament in it. She bore many years of sickness. Her final agony came in 1253. Many bishops and cardinals visited her in her last days and weeks because she was known to be such a holy woman and revered even then as a saint. She comforted her nuns and of, of the many things she said to them, she said, please never forget to practice holy poverty. She was canonised two years later in 1255 and her relics were translated to the church, were moved to the church of Santa Chiara just a few years later in 1260. So if you go to Assisi today, you can go to her convent where she was in San Damiano, but then you go to the, the convent, the present day convent of the Poor Clares in the centre of the town and there you can venerate the relics of St. Clair, her shrine, and the, the crucifix of San Damiano, the famous crucifix of St. Francis, the crucifix of San Damiano that spoke to Jesus. It's been moved from San Damiano Church, and it now hangs in a chapel in the church of Santa Chiara, St. Clair. At the end of the... Let me get my dates right here. The end of the 14th century. So say 140, 50 years later, there were 400 monasteries of St. Clair's. 400. And in recent times, I don't know the exact figure now, but when this Butler was right, well, when, when Butler's Lives of the Saints was revised about 20 years ago, I'm quoting here, very recently, there were 22,000 sisters in about a thousand different convents of the poor Clares, of, of enclosed Franciscan nuns. So what a gift Francis is, what a gift St. Clair is. The gift of the Franciscan spirit, the gift of following Jesus Christ in radical simplicity and poverty of heart, of spirit and poverty of life and of lifestyle. We're not all called to that fundamental renunciation that Francis and Claire did, but some people are. And the fact that they witnessed to that uncompromising love for Jesus Christ and imitation of his life and the centrality of poverty and simplicity and in that freedom, being able to love the Lord and to love especially the poor and the sick, that radical availability that the Franciscan movement shows to us, even if we don't become Franciscan monks and nuns, we can be inspired by Francis and Claire and learn from them. And I will put in the video link, in, in the video description, a link to a video about St. Francis, if you want to find out about him, and then soon about Franciscan spirituality and how we can apply that to our own lives. So I hope there's a bit of follow up if you want that there. Nice to be with you. Let's finish with a very short prayer, which is just to say, Saint Francis of Assisi, pray for us. Saint Claire of Assisi, pray for us. God bless. See you soon. <laughs>